Hey, turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. For New Year's, I always like to encourage you, because I know you're already thinking about it already, but I want to encourage you to be reading your Bible this next year. And so that's what we're going to talk about today from Psalm 119, verse 1. But before we uh, get into that, New Year's resolutions. Everyone loves a good New Year's resolution. How many of you are uh, emphatically anti New Year resolution. Any any emphatic anti New Year's resolutions? Yes. Okay. So something something's going on in the street house, uh, except for Will. I don't see Will's hand up. Nope. There it is. Okay. So you guys are anti New Year's resolution people. Why is that? It's stupid. So okay. All right. That's fine. That's fine. How, some, obviously, that's fine. I. I'm kind of with you. I I hate doing things that everybody else is doing, but at the same time, I do like a fresh start. How many of you are very, very pro New Year's resolution? How many of you love a good New Year's resolution? Macy, I I should have known. I hope that gets on the recording. Uh, Yes, okay. The rest of you are kind of in the middle like, uh, I'm not against it, I'm not for it, right? Is that that the gist of it, right? Okay, well, anyway, I always always do like a good opportunity to think about, hey, what do I want to do better next time? I'm always thinking about, hey... As something new is coming around again, I always want to do it better than last time. And so a new year, new me, I like that idea, right? So that's kind of how I approach it. I'm not like, I'm not like sitting down this afternoon writing out my New Year's resolutions. And I'm not going to like share them with anybody, although maybe I will. Maybe <laughs> Serena and I will talk about it later. But I kind of enjoy the idea of saying, what do I want to try to accomplish um, but here's some of the top, as you could have guessed, New Year's resolutions. Um, see if you can guess some of these. Um, many, many usually want to improve um, their diet in some way or form. How many of you probably guess that, right? Okay. Um, but more usually aspire to weight loss. Weight loss and diet are not the same thing. Uh, and even more usually want to improve their mental health, whatever that means. And even more always want to manage their money Better. Some, everybody, everybody wants to. Mo, uh, but, but most, as far as this uh, poll goes, guess what? What do most people uh, strive to do every January 1st? And it peters out every January 8th. Uh, anybody guess? Anybody guess? What? Read the Bible in a year. True, but no. Uh, yes, I was going there, but you were ahead of me. Anybody else? Anybody else? Work out. Work, I work out. Yes, that's right. Everybody starts their gym membership January, December 31st, and then ends it promptly at January 8th when they realize this is actually hard. And that really, that really gets under my skin. This is the reason why I don't like New Year's resolutions. You know why? Because I shop at Aldi. It's a great grocery store, <laughs> but it is in the same shopping district as a gym membership. In January 1 through 8th, it's always terrible. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, right? So anyway, um, but... I would suggest to you, even reading that list, it's just a random list that I found online last night while I was preparing, that uh, these are actual spiritual desires, if you think about it in a way, right? What is this? What is this? Physical fitness, finances, weight loss. This is a desire for more willpower, which is a spiritual category. Mental health, you want to change the way you think, you want to control your emotions. Those are spiritual desires in a sense. And if you think about it, if you think about it, All New Year's resolutions um, have in them a component of a desire for a spiritual newness to you. You want to be a new person in some way or another. You want to reshape your life and become new. You want to think differently. You want to feel differently. You want to live differently. And you want to be different kinds of people. Those are the essential desires behind New Year's resolutions, aren't they? I want to be different. Now, think about those categories of wanting to be different as we read uh, Psalm 119, 1 through 8. And we talk about the the other favorite New Year's resolution, which is read my Bible more, right? Think about these as we read Psalm 119. It says this, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of Yahweh. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies. They seek him with all their heart. They also do not walk, uh, do not work unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, may my ways be established to keep your statutes. 
Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Here, let's just make a few observations. Three observations. I want you to observe first the prize of the soul. First, observe the prize of the soul. The Bible, the Word of God, the law of the Lord, the precepts, the commands of the Lord are the prize of the soul. You can't escape this, right? It is the prize of the soul. Why is the Word of God the prize of God's people, the prize to the soul of God's people? You, you can see it there in verse 1 and verse 2. They, they declare how blessed is the one, how blessed is the one. This is a word that refers to being fortunate, being favored, being enriched, and in some translations you see happy. You are happy spiritually if you have a life that is in conformity to the word of God. And, and there even sometimes is a sense here of you are enviable. You're in an enviable spot. If, if people really, truly saw you spiritually and your life was living in conformity to God's word, if your life was dominated by God's word, if everything you did and thought was, was shaped by God's word, people would envy you. People would see your life and say, wow, your life is better than my life. I want to be more like you. They would, they would envy you. You are Blessed. Notice this, it's a prize to the soul. And this blessedness is not necessarily something that's hidden, spiritual, and secret. You, you probably can already see it here in this psalm, right? This is a blessedness that is inside of you, that is spiritual, yes, but it also will come outside of you very quickly as well. You will see it, and we see it here even in this little section of Psalm 119. Notice verse 7. People that are filled with God's word, are filled with thanksgiving in all things. It's, it's always a good day when God's word is reshaping and reforming your life. It's always a good day when God's word is filling your heart and your mind and is a, you know, a light to your feet and, and a lamp to your path. It is always a good day and your life is filled with thanksgiving. You will see that. Your neighbors will see that. Your friends will see that. Your family will see that. That is what it's called to be blessed. And notice also verse 6, these people are not ashamed. What does that mean to be not ashamed? Notice they are not ashamed as they observe the commandments of the Lord. We talked about this a few weeks ago uh, on Thursday night. Remember, God's word is your what? Mirror, and as you look at it, you're, you're not ashamed. My life is in conformity to God's word, and I'm not ashamed of it. No, all to say, people who devour their Bible, who delight in it, like this psalmist, who's probably David, by the way, is delighting in the word of God, they have a truly blessed experience. They consume God's word, and they are changed by God's word, and they are blessed. It is the prize to their soul. And here's my thought for you. Of all New Year's resolutions that you should strive for, it should be to be blessed. Blessed by God's word inside and out. What a good resolution to have. Lord, let me feast on your word to such an extent this year that I am changed by it and I am blessed. What a good thing. God's word is the ultimate prize. It's the ultimate New Year's resolution that everybody really is after, right? Because God's word changes you. That's a simple point that we see here. God's word changes you. How does it change you? I'm going to list off a few ways that God's word changes you. We're still under that God's word is the prize of the soul, but notice how it changes you. This is how you know it's the prize of the soul. I get this list from one of my favorite books on Bible reading out there. It's called How to Eat Your Bible by our own, you know, Nate Pickowicz that we just had here at, at our Steadfast Conference. If you at all are struggling with a desire to read God's Word, I can't recommend this book enough. Go order it on Amazon. Go buy it from the bookstore. Yeah, go buy it from the bookstore uh, right now, today. Read it this afternoon before you even go to bed. At least read the first few chapters. I reviewed this book, and especially the first few chapters, and guess what? It made me want to devour my Bible anew. You come to the end of the year, maybe you're a little tired, you don't really feel like you're really motivated to read God's Word. Motivate yourself, 
through this book. I, mean, I read this book three years ago, two years ago, and it has changed my life, and it's still doing so today. But here is a list, just a list that he gives in this book about how God's Word changes you. Write down these reasons. First off, God's Word changes your spirit. God's Word changes your spirit. It, it, it creates in you a new you, in a sense. Uh, the theological word that we speak of that you see in the Bible is the Word of God regenerates you. The Word of God causes you to be born again. It changes you. It changes your spirit. John 3, 3 through 8, and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You need to be changed anew. You need to be changed from within and cleansed from within by the Spirit to even see spiritual things and even enter into spiritual joys. That is what Jesus is saying. But the Spirit, notice this, the Spirit always works through the Word of God in us. Ephesians 1.13 says this, In Him you also, after listening to the Word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him through the Holy Spirit of promise. The, the, The Spirit of God always changes you, changes your spirit, not just through some magical something that happens, but through the Word of God. The Spirit of God works through the Word of God. Luther says this, in this psalm, Psalm 119, he's talking about this, David always says that he will speak, think, talk, hear, read day and night constantly, but about nothing else than God's Word and commandments. For God wants to give you His Spirit only through the external Word. That's Martin Luther God, you want more of God's Spirit in your life? You want the Spirit to be conforming you and shaping you and transforming you? Do you want to feel the power of the Spirit in your life? Absorb and soak in and devour God's Word because God's Spirit works through His Word. There, there it is. God's Word changes your spirit. It makes you new. How about the second way God's Word changes you? God's Word changes your mind. God's Word changes your mind. It changes the way you think. Now, maybe you wouldn't admit it publicly, but I bet most of you, in the quietness of your heart and in your mind, you would like to change the way you think a lot. You look back on this year and you say, wow, a lot of poor thinking, a lot of poor choices. I wish I could have approached a situation a little bit better. I wish I would have thought about something different and avoided a certain circumstance. I I am in a few pitfalls right now in my life because of my thinking that brought me there. I wish I could change the way I think. Well, good news for you. God's Word changes your mind. Notice Proverbs 2, 6. Yahweh gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and discernment. Yahweh breathes out knowledge, and your thinking will be transformed. You can look at Psalm 119... 130, I love this verse, the unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. As you read God's word, you gain understanding. Your mind and your will, and but mainly your thinking is changed. Psalm 119, 104 says this, from your precepts I get perception. My my. My perceiving of things, my thinking through things is changed, and therefore I hate every false way. The Word of God changes your mind. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful thing. Uh, Pickowix says this, In studying the Bible, we learn to think God's thoughts after Him. In other words, we learn to think in biblical categories. Even the most childlike believer can read the Bible and receive wisdom and understanding from the Lord. As I was uh, thinking about this message, my mind went to my mother-in-law, who I have great respect for, and, and one of the reasons I have respect for her is this story I'm going to tell you about her right now. Um, she was texting us just a few weeks ago, um, her, her two daughters and, and their two um, husbands, 
of which I am one, and that's why she's my mother-in-law. Um, and she was kind of sharing how 20 years ago she had started to memorize Scripture intensively. And I'll tell you how intensively in a moment, but let me just first say this, that she was struggling with thinking, and in her thinking she was sinning, and she recognized it. She was sinning in her thinking against other people in her life, and she recognized that she needed to change the way she thought because her life was just beholden to just random thinking. And she didn't like that. And so she began to memorize Scripture. And she would argue that memorizing Scripture has been one of the biggest, most impactful things that she has done in her life and really has been transforming to her. Um, She likens God's Word to being with her like day and night. When the light goes out, God's Word is still with her. It's always coming to her, she says, throughout the day, and she's challenged in her thinking, and she even stops early in sin. This is what she said in this text. Many verses come to me as I walk through my, my normal life. I cannot step very far in a wrong direction in my thinking, in my speech, or in my actions without a verse reminding me of the direction I should take. It's pretty constant. It feels like it has been a constant nourishing and feeding of my soul that has caused much growth. Listen to what she's saying, right? The Word of God stops her when she is sinning because the Word of God is filling her. She's not just reading it, she's working to memorize it. And when I press her on how much she's actually memorized, I am shocked because she says to me that I, she said, she said, I, I've memorized Mark and John and then from Romans through Second Peter. Just let me break that down for you. She, in the last 20 years, she has memorized Mark, the Gospel of Mark, John, and then Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. She just finished Romans. Now, she would herself say it's been very hard to maintain. She's had to kind of repeat 24 books a a week in order to keep up with this. And maybe that doesn't sound like something that's very doable for you, but notice what change and transformation that this has had in her life, right? She can't go anywhere without the Word of God going with her. She can't think anything without the Word of God thinking with her. She can't do anything without the Word of God a mirror before her face. What a wonderful blessedness in having the Word of God change the way you think. That's the blessing that she enjoys. I'm I'm just asking you, don't you want the Word of God to be a light in your life like that? It might not have to be 18 New Testament books, but it could be one book, it could be one chapter, it could be one verse, a series of verses, although I would really recommend a large section. But wouldn't you like to have the Word of God always with you, a lamp to your feet and a light to your path, correcting you, exhorting you, encouraging you, shaping you, transforming you, giving you perception in the way you think. Well, if you want that, it begins with a heart and a desire to devour God's Word. You have to say, today, right here in your seat, I want to eat up my Bible this year. I want to consume it because I want to change in my thinking. What's the result of change in thinking? This is the next change that God's Word brings in you. It doesn't just change your mind. It also, God's Word changes your emotions. It changes how you feel. It changes your affections in some senses. Affections and feelings are different words, but that's the general gist of it. Uh, When you change the way you think in your circumstances, I would argue that you change the way you feel in your circumstances. I'm not saying you'll be without grief. I'm not saying you'll be without sorrow. I'm not saying you'll be without depression, but that will look very different to you than without the Word of God. How, how do you know that? Well, it's been, it's been an experience that I've hoped that you've already begun to see through our time in James, right? James 1, why should I rejoice in trials? Well, because trials, you remember this, strengthen my faith but only if I pray to God for wisdom in them, because wisdom, right, thinks eternally. Wisdom looks forward to the crown. Wisdom knows that temptation comes where? From my heart, and wisdom trusts everything that comes from God, right? You see already that 
knowing God's word, knowing God's will changes the way you think, and changing the way you think causes you to change the way you feel. You rejoice right at the beginning. You rejoice in trials, don't you? That's what you do when God's word fills your mind. It also soaks down into your emotions. And, and one of the, the terms that you see in the Bible again and again, an emotional term, right, that God's people have is what? They have incredible joy. That's what I see all throughout the Bible. Psalm 119, 97, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 71 through 72, afflictions are a friend. They're welcomed. Not that you go looking for afflictions, but look at what afflictions do. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. The word of God changes your emotions. It changes your affections. It doesn't change your circumstances. It doesn't change necessarily all the the spectrum of feelings you will have, but it maybe will change the way you feel about your circumstances. And last thing, the Word of God, God's Word, changes your will. It changes what you do. It changes what you do. If you're a Christian, if you're dominated by the Word of God, you live a different life because the Word of God has changed your mind about what is sin and what is not, what is helpful and what is not, what is delightful and what is not. And therefore, the Word of God challenges the way you think and challenges your will. And you know that God has truly changed who you are when you do life differently. Ephesians 5, 26 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify Her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, you're going to say, like, this is written to husbands. Why do I need to write this? I just wanted to point out that this is giving an exhortation to husbands based on what Christ has done for the church, for you, right? Notice the logic here. Christ has redeemed the church, you, so that you might be sanctified and changed through his word. It's the purpose for which Christ died. No, in other words, if you, if you are in the habit of neglecting the word of God and not obeying the word of God, you are working against the very purpose and reason for which Christ died. But if you think about it the other way, right? When you are seeking to be transformed by the Word of God, you are actually pursuing the very thing, the very will of God that Christ died for. There's great assurance in that, right? As I read my Bible and I seek to be changed by it, I am pursuing the reason for which Christ died, that I might grow and be sanctified in the truth. And His Word is truth, right? There's an assurance of change in that, right? I know God will change me through his word because that is the reason for which Christ died for me. Therefore, I can be assured that Christ will transform me. But all to say, it is, it is this idea that the believer pursues and wants to pursue in being changed through God's word. But God's word changes your will. You can't read God's word for long and either come to the conclusion that you are a Christian or you aren't a Christian based on what your will is doing. Do I want to obey Christ, love Christ? How do I act in this situation? That is what God's Word will do. Once again, this is all the praise for the Word of God, right? This is the prize of the soul. The Bible is the prize of the soul. And I would even say pursuing the Bible is a strength, a strength that everybody really, really wants when they're trying to figure out New Year's resolutions. And I would argue that it should be the center of, of what you pursue if you want to be new this next year. Do you want to change the way you think? Do you want to change the way you feel? Do you want to change the way you act? Then get into the Word of God, because the Word of God changes you dramatically, remarkably. Sorry, my page was upside down. Just want to make sure on the right. All right, part two, uh, observation two from Psalm 119. If you go back to it, Psalm 119, verses four, I want you to also notice the priority of the soul. What is the priority of the soul? What place and priority does God's word have in the soul that makes God's word such a prize to the soul? Uh, To what extent does the word of God grip you? 
uh, that suddenly it results in this blessedness that I'm talking about, this life transformation that we're talking about. Let's say, let's talk about the priority of the soul. Verse 4, God says to you, if you will be blessed by his word, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. You have to keep God's word, seek them, but then seek to keep them diligently. The word speaks of doing something exceedingly, making every effort, um, doing something to the highest degree. You keep God's word diligently. And we can even see this in the psalm that we've covered so far, verse 2, right? You must seek the word of God with all of your heart. What does it mean to seek God's word with all of your heart? It means that you live a life that is consumed with knowing God's word and knowing God's way and knowing God's will. It is with all of your heart. Verse 3 says, uh, they walk in his ways. Your life is characterized by God's ways and not man's ways. Do you see that? This, this, is, this is the priority of the soul, right? My whole heart is after the word of God. My whole heart is gripped by a desire to live in conformity with God's word and God's will. By the way, don't be fooled there. When he says, verse 1, walk in the law of Yahweh, this isn't just saying the Ten Commandments. This isn't just saying you try really, really hard not to kill anybody. This is saying, I am pursuing the whole instruction of God, all the instruction that God has given me, whether it's distant instruction in the Old Testament or closer instruction to my situation in the New Testament. I am choosing to pursue all of God's word. That's what law means. But, but notice this person who has a priority of the word of God in the soul, uh, they're after more than just knowing right Sunday school answers, right? That's not what they want ultimately. Their, their desire is to be conformed to God's word, right? They, they want everything to be shaped by God's word. Their heart has a priority in God's word. They don't just want the comforts of the Bible, they want the conformity of the Bible. That is what the priority of the soul looks like. Uh, Psalm 119, 162 says this, I rejoice at your word as one who finds much spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. That is the priority of the soul that you are seeing there. Turn over to 90, verse 97. This is one of my favorite parts. Verse 97, this is the whole section. 119, 97 through 101 says this, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are mine forever. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I perceive more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. Notice this. I am more. I am transformed. There is a priority in my soul, and I am more than all of my teachers and all of these things. You become more than many things. Let me give you an illustration, a negative illustration of having the Word of God as the priority of your soul. So we already talked, I already gave you an illustration of someone who has had a life changed by the Word of God, but here's an illustration of someone who had their life unchanged by the Word of God. Turn over in your Bibles to 1 Kings 14. 1 Kings 14. This is right at the beginning of the, as we speak of it, uh, the divided kingdom in Israel. Uh, the united kingdom was under David and then Solomon, but then Solomon had a half heart for God, as you see, and then God said, I'm going to strip the kingdom from uh, the house of David and leave one leave one tribe, really two, uh, Judah and Benjamin, but Benjamin kind of gets sucked into Judah. I'm going to leave one tribe for David, but then ten tribes I'm going to uh, split away, tear away from David and give them to another. And the first king of the northern kingdom is a man called Jeroboam. Now, oh, how does that name strike you? Would you name your kid Jeroboam? Probably not. It just sounds like a bad guy, right? If there was ever a guy with a bad name, it's Jeroboam, right? Or maybe that's just because of the massive negative connotation he has. You cannot read 1 Kings or 2 Kings without 
having a strong dislike for the name Jeroboam. Because constantly there's two names that everybody's being compared to all throughout Kings, right? It is, you are acting just like David, or you are acting just like Jeroboam. This is a man that you don't want to be like. But believe it or not, Jeroboam, as you see here in 1 Kings 14, he actually had a kingdom that started out on a, a pretty positive note. He received a prophetic word from God that he would be receiving the ten tribes of Israel. And not only this, but Yahweh also made him a promise that if he followed after God and God's ways with all of his heart, that he, Yahweh, would establish Jeroboam's kingdom like David's. Jeroboam received fantastic prophecy and promises from God. For example, just turn over to 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 38. Notice this. This is Yahweh talking to Jeroboam. It will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. (laughs) Yahweh gives an incredible assurance to Jeroboam of all people that I will make your house like David's. And maybe you're thinking in the back of your head, That's not a very good offer because this entire prophecy that that God's giving to Jeroboam is all about how he's tearing away the house from David. That doesn't sound like very enduring to me. But remember, Yahweh is still keeping one tribe for David and continues to repeat his faithfulness to David. Matter of fact, we even see it here that I am only going to discipline the house of David for a while. God has permanent promises for David. But just notice that, feel that. Jeroboam gets incredible promises from God. God says, I am going to give you a kingdom, and if you follow me, I will secure your kingdom. What, what a word from God to Jeroboam. And, and, and that's why it's, it's always surprising to me when I read through 1 Kings at how far Jeroboam falls. For those of you that are, are not familiar with the history, he is kind of the one that makes idolatry in the northern kingdom of Israel, just uh, normal. And, and he causes idolatry to be so deeply rooted in Israel that he is the one that is credited with the, the cause of causing them to be scattered and destroyed by the kingdom of Assyria later on. Matter of fact, notice, jump, jump over to chapter 12, verse 28. 12, verse 28, notice what he does. <clears throat> The king uh, Jeroboam took counsel and made two golden calves, and he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He makes two idols, one in Bethel, which is in the very southern end of his kingdom, and one in Dan, that is in the very northern end of his kingdom, because he doesn't want Israel to go to Jerusalem and worship there. And notice the language. It's just like Exodus 32. He is building a golden calf, and he is claiming that this golden calf is the God who brought them out of Egypt. He's making a false form of religion that looks like Yahweh worship, but isn't. And for that reason, he turned Israel wildly astray. It seems as though he has no interest in listening to God's law. He does not have any delight in walking in God's way, and he has no desire to conform himself to God's commands. That is Jeroboam. And by the way, all of this, once again, is rooted in his fear, right? It's just rooted in his fear. He doesn't have intense rebellion for God because he just hates God. He has intense rebellion for God because he fears the kingdom of Israel being taken away from him if people simply go to Jerusalem and worship under Jerusalem. You see this in chapter 12, verse 25. Jeroboam says in his heart, verse 26, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now let that be a lesson to you, right? Right? Your fears and anxieties are the platforms sometimes on which great sin will result if you let those fears and those anxieties to rule you instead of God's word ruling you, right? 
uh, small doubts, small insecurities can lead to very big sins. That is why Jeroboam led all of Israel into this abomination. It, it is surprising how sinful Jeroboam leads Israel in. And, and for that reason, as you turn to 1 Kings 14, it's also surprising, it's also very surprising when Jeroboam does what we're about to see in this chapter. We think we've got Jeroboam all figured out, and then he switches it on us again, right? We think we have him figured and squared as somebody who just doesn't like Yahweh at all and has no room for Yahweh's word in his life, but we're actually very uh, surprised to find out that it's different. He's not that way at all. Jer- uh, look at this, 1 Kings 14, verse 1. At that time, Abijah, the, s- the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam. And go to Shiloh, and behold, Ahijah the prophet is there who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people. And then take ten loaves with you, some cakes and a jar of honey, and go to him, and he will tell you what will happen to the boy. Notice this. It's, It's surprising, right? Because suddenly Jeroboam's homespun religion and homespun prophets are not good enough for him. And, and I kinda, you kind of see this all the time, right? As the saying goes, there's no atheists in foxholes. And when trouble really starts, people seem to start praying and people seem to return to the old pew. You know, that's, that's what we see. And, but we see here that Jeroboam, when he actually needed real comfort, he comes back to Yahweh, the one who made him the great promises. And, and notice what he's trying to do here. He's trying to disguise his wife so that, I don't know, maybe all of northern Israel won't recognize that he is consulting Yahweh again. Probably not, because he's trying to make, remember, a false form of Yahweh worship. I don't think he's afraid of that. I actually think what he's doing with disguising his wife is trying to keep uh, Ahijah, the prophet, from recognizing that it's his wife or his kid. Maybe he's thinking, if the prophet doesn't know it's my kid or my wife, he'll give me a more favorable reading. And notice he also gives a really generous gift as well. Maybe I can buy a good prediction for the outcome of my son. But notice what is really striking here. This is a man who really actually likes the comforting parts of God's Word. He actually likes God's Word when it promises you things. But he has no desire, notice this, he has no desire to live a life that's in conformity to God's word, does he? No, he's okay with God's word as long as God's word says good things to him. But you see this in in, in 1 Kings 13 especially. As soon as God's word begins to rebuke him, he rebels against God's word. I have no interest in letting God's word rule my life, but if God's word wants to tell me a few good things here and there, I'll take it, right? That's what you've got to be careful of. Why do you come to God's Word? Do you come to God's Word for the comfort, or do you come to God's Word because you know that the comfort is on the other side of conformity? I want to be transformed, and that is the only way I will ever receive blessing in this life. That is the only way I'll ever have peace in this life if my life is shaped by God's Word. That is Jeroboam, the one who wanted God's comfort, but not God's conformity. Let's look at the final part from Psalm 119, going back here. The final part, we've we've seen the prize of the soul. We've seen the priority of the soul. It must dominate your whole life. You must be going after the Word of God for conformity, not just comfort. But notice also the prayer of the soul, the prayer of the soul that prizes the Word of God. Verse 5 through 8. Notice what it says. O May my ways be established to keep your statutes. Uh, Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Oh, that my ways might be established. NASB says, oh, that my ways were established. Uh, Holman Christian says, if only my ways were committed to keeping. And New King James says, oh, that my ways were directed to keeping. Notice what the, the psalmist David probably is, is saying here. He's offering a prayer to God and saying, if only my life were fixed to keep your word. If only I was made firm in your words. If only I was 
unmovable in, in seeking after you. If only you would establish me like a mountain in a, in a storm, like a house in the wind. If only you would establish me heavily in your word that I would not be moved from it, then I would be blessed. Lord, please establish me in your word. This is, this is a point that God's people feel, right? I, I know how lazy I am. If only God would transform me. I know how distracted I can be in reading the Bible. I know how confused in my thinking I can be. If only God would establish me in his word. And, and notice how the, the psalm kind of ends here. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. There is this beseeching of God, this prayer to God that, hey, I want your word, but I need you to transform me so that I will be fixed on your word. You need to go to God's word with God dependence and self-doubt. You need to go to God's word saying, I need to be changed. You need to go to God's word with humility saying, this word is going to confront me and convict me, give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Help me not to reject and not to rebel when it gets uncomfortable, but help me to have a soft heart that's willing to receive your word. Establish me in your word. Notice the very hope of being changed by God's word, of, of counting God's word as a blessing to your soul and a prize of your soul is if God establishes you in his word. Or all to say, if, 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 you're, if you're not going to ask God to transform you through your Bible reading, even the best Bible reading program will not do you any good. Hey, you must go to God in prayer as you are reading God's word. Otherwise, God's word will have no blessing in your life. And that is perhaps the biggest thing that you need to work on. Now, here's, here's a few, just a few applications with a lot of subpoints. Uh, number one, approach God's word with a prayer for God to change you, right? That is the idea. If, if you are hungering for a transformed life, maybe it's something in your thinking, maybe it's in your emotions, your affections, or your will, or in your very being itself, it begins with you praying to God as you go to his word. Oh Lord, change me. Establish me in your word as I see myself in your word. Help me to see myself biblically. Not the way I want to be seen or want to see myself, but the way you see me, but establish me in your word. Approach God's word with a prayer for God to change you. But then I'd also say, in order for God's word to change you, you have to be in God's word and you have to have discipline in God's word. And I would say approach God's word with a plan to pursue God's word this year. The, the more of a plan you have, the better of a chance you will have in following that plan. The less of a plan you have, the less of a plan you'll follow. I mean, that, maybe that's obvious. But to me, I find it to be the case. If I do not do something through discipline, I will not do it at all. There's lots of good ways to read your Bible. Last year I talked about my top tens for you and I changed them every single year. Let me just read out a few of them. Here's a few ideas that you could you could maybe pursue God's word through this year. Read your Bible with the sermons you're hearing. Maybe read through James repeatedly as we're going through James on Thursday nights. Maybe read through Matthew as Pastor Steve is preaching through Matthew. But read and meditate on your sermon notes. That's one idea. Maybe read your Bible to prepare for the sermons you hear. We, we talked about this a little bit with God's Word being your mirror. Maybe every day focus on, through God's Word, saying, Lord, prepare my heart through this daily reading so that I would hear your Word when it is spoken to me. Maybe read your Bible in a simple way, like some people do with the Psalms and the Proverbs. They read the Psalm and the Proverb of the day. So on the first, which is tomorrow, you read Psalm 1 and Proverbs 1. And on the second, you read uh, Psalm 2 and Proverbs 2. And you just do that Every single month you'll know the beginning of the Psalms really well and you'll know the Proverbs really well as well. Just commit to that practice. All you need to know is what day it is and then you know where to read. Maybe you want to try reading your Bible in a whole year. It's an ambitious challenge. It has some drawbacks, i.e. fatigue and difficulty, but it is well worth it and it is worth pursuing. If you want good plans for that, I can give you some. Maybe try to read one book of the Bible repeatedly all month long this next year. For example, I've read all of these books of the Bible 30 times in the Old Testament, 15 times, and see my bookmarks are getting much 
I got quite a few here. It has changed my life, and this is one of the reasons why I'm speaking to you today, because I'm so convinced by reading God's Word repeatedly. Maybe that's something you want to do. I just want to spend all month reading James, or I want to spend all month reading First John, or I want to read uh, Ephesians all month, once a day, every single day of the month, and just try to get a feel for what's going on and how God is speaking to me there. Maybe read through a certain Bible study book. So MacArthur has these little little books that you can buy, little Bible studies that you can go through and study a book of the Bible and fill in these answers. The ESV Study Bible also has little booklets like that as well. These will help you read and apply the Bible fairly well. Maybe, how about this, try something new this January. Say, in the morning, for my quiet time, I am going to spend time praying, and then I'm going to be spending time memorizing. And I have a goal to memorize a whole chapter of the Bible or a whole book of the small part of my Bible, or, or you know, something like that. Just say, I am going to just, just for a month, just to see how it goes, I'm going to spend my quiet time memorizing and repeating and working on knowing God's Word. Yeah, there's lots of other things too, but we'll stop with that. But let me just say, in all of these plans, please also plan on the following three things. Read your Bible with prayer, like we were talking about, and read your Bible with an unhurried hunger to be with God, and read your Bible with an unhurried hunger to be conformed and changed by it, right? Read your Bible with prayer, read your Bible with hunger, and read your Bible with a desire to be changed. What what can I learn today? It might be a small little thing. It might be the fact that Jeroboam had a lot of fear and anxiety that led to all of his sin, but what application can I take from this passage that I read today that I can say I want to be changed according to this verse? And that that all starts in your perspective as you are approaching God's Word, right? If you approach it with prayer, if you approach it saying, God, change me today through your Word, that is what you will be seeking. If you're approaching the Bible every single morning saying, I just want to get this done so I can tell Pastor David that I did it, so I don't have to look at him with this guilty look next year, next time he preaches on reading the Bible. If that is your approach to reading the Bible, that's what you'll get out of it. You'll get out of it a check mark. If you approach it with a desire to be changed and transformed and grown through God's Word, that is what you will get out of it. Either way, approach God's Word with a hunger. God's Word has an incredible, powerful, transforming nature to it. And what you must do is is approach it with humility. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for this day that we've been given to think about the new year and new strategies we can put in place to pursue you and your word better. We pray that we would do this and be faithful to it. Amen.